Okay. So good, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for the introduction to Dr. Meekins to be here tonight. That's a great pleasure to kick off uh, the 2021 series of presentations here. I am like a usually frequent spectator, so I'm really glad to be here presenting the work from my group has done. So uh, today we're going to speak a little bit about the work we've done with zinc oxides. That's a project we start in 2017, 2018, and we're glad we were able to publish most of the results that are going to present here uh, last year, okay, so in 2020. So I like collected the data from that paper we published, and then I picked that, like I think it was like a, a very cohesive talk to talk about tonight, okay? So a little bit about, uh, let's start talking a little bit about who I am, although Dr. Meekins introduced, okay? Like I probably I'm new to most of you. So uh, I'm a current assistant professor at Manhattan College in New York City, okay? So I start my position not so long ago. Uh, I start in this position in 2000, uh, fall 2019. So I have a little over a year, so a year and a half in this position. But before doing that, uh, I held a visiting faculty position in research at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York, the same city where the Cornell University is. So I started that in fall 2017, okay? So roughly right after, uh, two months after I defended my PhD. So I have like a very, like a not so traditional trajectory as I didn't take like a, a uh, traditional postdoc. So it's kind of like willing to start doing my own stuff, my own ideas and like building up new students and uh, let them get knowledge. So I decided not to follow that traditional path and like go straight like for some visiting faculty position as that would give me more like exposure to uh, that like routine to work with students, like let the things have the ideas and try to make the things work, okay? Yeah, so you had that position in Ithaca College, in Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, from fall 2017 until uh, the spring 2019. Uh, my PhD, I got my PhD from University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. My PhD is in chemistry, okay? Uh, I got a master's there as well, like as part of the candidacy exam, you get a master's degree from that, so in 2014. My advisor in graduate school, University of Minnesota, was Professor uh, Lee Penn, uh, which uh, does a lot of uh, materials synthesis and characterization for environmental application, for renewable energy application. So that's where I got my PhD from, and like uh, most of the passion that I have for science from her as well. Really great mentor. And prior to come to US, so I'm uh, born and raised in Brazil. So I'm a Brazilian by birth, okay? And that's where I got my undergraduate degree from. So from Federal University of São Carlos, which is also my hometown, which is known by the acronym UFSCar. I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry there. And then I got a master's degree in physical chemistry as well with Professor Emerson Camargo really great mentor as well. And then that's after that I moved to Minnesota. So that's a little bit introduction about who I am. Uh, about Manhattan College, people uh, usually are not familiar with the institution. They know uh, the name Manhattan itself sounds really fancy, but people don't know much about the college as well. Uh, so basically Manhattan College, it's what we usually call a uh, PUI, so a primarily undergraduate institution, okay? It was founded in 1853 by the La Salle Christian Brothers, so it has a Catholic affiliation, okay? It's managed uh, by the uh, La Salle uh, uh, Christian Brothers. And the uh, fun fact about the college and the college name that although it's called Manhattan College, it's not located in Manhattan anymore. Okay, so it's been located in Bronx, I think until like beginning 1920s, it has been the Bronx, but like they kept the name Manhattan College because it used to be Manhattan like the first 70 years from the college and it'd be a little troublesome to the alumni to change the name by that way. So they usually 
uh, they kept the name, okay? And it stayed up to now. Uh, those are a little numbers before the, the pandemic started, but like uh, before last academic year started, the college usually had like 4,000 students, around 240 full-time faculty. Uh, I'm a faculty in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, which has uh, 12 full-time faculty, okay? So we have like a, a other two new faculties that start with me. Some of them have like a huge presence on Twitter as well, like me. So that would be a good people to talk with all the weeks as well. Uh, there are master programs in Manhattan College, but most of them are engineering, like uh, chemical, environmental, electrical, civil, civil, computer, and mechanical, uh, but not in chemistry at all, okay? So basically all the work we've done here has been relying mostly in undergraduate students. So they are the major workforce in the projects and obviously have some internal and external collaboration that help us with the uh, characterization techniques that we don't have in house as well. And with some discussions like to enrich um, the quality of our publication. But as I told most of the work and the work that are presented here it was done by undergrads primarily. So uh, the major motivation to do the work that we do is the uh, water, okay? Uh, basically this map over here, it shows like a expectation about what water stress is supposed to be by uh, like 19 years from now, by 2040, okay? So water stress, as it's told in the slide, is the ratio between the amount of water consumed and amount of, amount of water available or supplied in that certain region. And as you can see here in this map, so as the color gets closer to the red, as more red it is, more critical the situation is supposed to be. And you see that US, uh, it's, the situation is uh, extremely critical in this uh, prediction, okay? So US and like huge part of like Europe here, okay? Parts in India as well, North, Northern Africa. So it shows us that it's very essential if you find ways that you can improve water quality, if you find ways that you can uh, remediate wastewater. So that's the main motivation of our group. That's the major problem where we start and uh, we look for solutions. So that's our motivation to prepare new materials, to learn new techniques to prepare. Uh, so far at least it has been like find good ways like to find materials that had at least potential to have some benefit regarding like improving water quality. And a uh, huge problem we observe related with the water, it's about uh, textile dyes, okay? It's a huge pollutant uh, for the water worldwide. Uh, US in general, the situation is not like as bad as other, other places like India, uh, that there's a huge disposal of uh, dyes and other things that are uh, come from different types of industries like uh, textile industry, paper industry, cellulose industry, and so on. So, but like it's still a, a major problem that needs some sort of remediation and solution, okay? And textile dyes, they're really uh, uh, worrisome relating like discharge in the environment because they usually, uh, the textile industry, they use them a lot, okay? Uh, a statistic that I picked that I thought is really interesting is that to be able to, to dye like a, a kilogram of cloth, it may require around like uh, 30 to 50 liters of water, okay? So imagine how much water is taken by the process and all that water has interacted with the dye and that need to be discharg uh, discharged somehow. So that water is not pure anymore. It has dye on, the, on it. So it's essential to find good ways to try to take that water out. We have like a, a really like relatively old picture. So like in the National River, I think seeing, I might be wrong, but I think it's Connecticut if I'm not mistaken, in the 1960s, okay? So where the, the river got like, a dye color, uh, red dye coloration. 
uh, due to pollution from dyes from the textile and paper mill industry. Not only the water itself uh, suffers when uh, there is contamination by, by dyes, but also all the population that lives around that as well. And as population, we don't mean only like the human beings, also the animals, the plants, uh, all the things that are around that water uh, body, they are subject to that pollution. They are secondary, uh, uh, like they suffer from that pollution in some extent as well. Here you have like a, an example, like a, that's like a interesting news. It's 2017, so August 2017. And like not so not so nice, but it's a little funny uh, to see that like the the dog. So the dog uh, was around uh, that polluted river in uh, in India and probably played in the river and when they left the river, it turned like completely blue, okay? So that's the, that's the uh, idea, show that how that water pollution can affect all the organisms that live nearby that water body. And not only uh, like in the close proximity, but like in the medium and long range as well, as that the water needs that could be uh, reused or other things and it was really, really bad. So uh, one of the strategies that we use in our group to try to remediate water is the photocatalysis. We have others besides photocatalysis, like adsorption is another big area in our group, something we devoted a lot of time with the students, which are not gonna talk today, okay? But we're gonna focus most in photocatalysis. So what photocatalysis is? So basically semiconductors, they have a valence band and a conduction band. And there is an energy separation between the two bands, which is called the band gap energy, okay? When that semiconductor, semiconductor is in contact with the radiation having energy equal or higher this band gap energy, what happens is there is a, uh, electron hole pair separation, okay? So electrons, they are excited from the valence band to the conduction band. And once they are excited, they leave a hole in the valence band, okay? That's what happens on this case. So the two uh, charge carriers, they're kind of like physically separated in different bands. And as a consequence of that charge carrier, so electron hole separation, uh, we can take advantage of that and use that like for the uh, very useful way to try to decontaminate water from the dyes. How we do that? So basically, that holes that stayed in the valence band, they can uh, oxidize the water and producing uh, hydroxyl radicals, which are uh, very reactive. Uh, oxygen species. And similarly, what gonna, uh, can happen with the electrons that went to the conduction band. So uh, the electrons from the conduction band can react with the oxygen and form uh, oxygen minus radicals. Those radicals, they're very reactive oxygen species in such a way that they can react with the pollutant molecule, with the dye molecule, both this oxygen minus radical and the hydroxyl radical, they can react with pollutant molecule and uh, basically break down that molecule, okay? So that breakage of the molecule can be partial, okay? Uh, but like ideally what is expected to happen is a complete mineralization of that dye molecule, which means that that dye molecule, which usually has uh, a very complex and like relatively long structure uh, most of times containing benzene rings, co conjugated bonds, and so on, that should be uh, changed and converted to water and CO2. So that's what, uh, what's expected from a complete photocatalytic process, okay? So that's how we use photocatalysis. That's how we use semiconductors to try to break down the uh, dye molecules. So as I told, this is the paper that I'll be talking 
uh, about most of the results tonight. Uh, it was published, I think, July uh, last year in the Journal of Environmental Chemical Engineering. Uh, it was the uh, basically, I would say that like probably a little over like 85% of the results present in the paper were done by two undergraduates that time that uh, Andrew Skinner uh, and Anthony DiBernardo. So they work with me at the time that was in Ithaca. Okay. Uh, and that's when we started that project with these two undergrads. Usually Andrew started and Anthony took over for a whole summer and things went really well uh, on that. Re uh, two really good students, which allow me to have like a full uh, confidence on the results and like the way they perform the equipment and the way they collect the data. So very reliable, which gives like the confidence to go beyond and try to uh, write the paper and have them as first authors on this publication. Besides then, we have uh, as collaborator, Professor Nirupan Aish, which is also very present in our Twitter, uh, Ken Twitter community from uh, Department of uh, Civil Structural Environment Engineering from University of Buffalo in upstate New York. Uh, and his undergraduate, uh, his graduate student, his PhD student, uh, Arvid Masood. Okay, so they are both uh, the collaborators we have in this project. So basically, um, Professor Aish and I, we have been working together basically as soon as I started as faculty. So we met in a in a small conference, and then we start to to work together. So basically, he's one of the uh, major sources of resources that I look for in the case that I there's some sort of characterization that I can't do right on Manhattan College. So we have like a good partnership. We're able to publish so far two papers together and we hope to, to keep doing that. Yeah, so those are the, and obviously me as like the, the, the leading PI. So we are the, the five people uh, taking, that took this study together. So the die uh, that you're aimed to, uh, to break down on this process was called uh, tyrazine. Tyrazine is a, a azo dye, as you can see here, by like the nitrogen, double nitrogen bond here, okay? Uh, it's found in candies, beverages, and baker products. Uh, it's not a so uh, harmful dye, that it's not something that like is very toxic, such a way that if you take some, you immediately may die but it can cause a lot of side effects like asthma, migraines, eczema, thyroid cancer, and lupus, okay? So it's not something like, uh, you obviously need like a higher dose, but like think about a community that lives around some water body contaminated by this type of dye. It can have like a cumulative effect over the years. So it's always good to try to find ways. And also obviously like there's also the fundamental science behind as well. Uh, there is the application side, like having that like motivation to real situation, but there's also like the, the fundamental side and also like the limitations we have as well. So usually if you, that's the case, if you have a dye, so as a, the name says a dye, so it has absorption in the visible range of the spectra. For us, it's faster to track that concentration and easier because you can do all the concentrations by UVV spectroscopy, okay? So we use, as I told before, we use photocatalysis uh, to try to simulate, um, to try to remove, to degrade this molecule in simulated wastewater. As simulated wastewater, uh, it's a very, uh, in this case, it's relatively simple composition for that. It's basically uh, dionized water with the dye uh, in the concentration, like the PPM range concentration. So it's a very simple uh, model for simulated wastewater. We didn't have like any, like any buffer or any sort to adjust ionic strength or anything like that. As was like one of the first studies in the group, okay? And then the uh, zinc oxide nanorods, okay? So zinc oxide is a semiconductor, okay? 
So uh, it has what, call, what we call uh, a direct band gap, okay? So basically, once there is energy with band gap, I think the band gap, if I'm not mistaken, is around 2.7, uh, so electron volts. So if you have energy with, if you have an incident source of light with energy equal or higher 2.7 electron volts, you can excite the electrons straight from the uh, valence to conduction band, okay? There's no any intermediate process like phonon assistance like you would observe in an indirect process. So how you prepare those nanorods? It's a relatively simple process, not that complicated. So it took like the zinc acetate, put that in ethanol, uh, in appropriate bottles that can uh, withstand like high pressure, the high vapor pressure from ethanol at higher temperature, and heat it up in a uh, in an oil bath at 106 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, uh, and then we use two uh, different types of bases throughout this process, and the bases that we use are very uh, decisive factor to obtain different morphologies for the zinc oxide. So one of the bases you use was the uh, HMTA, as you can see here on more the left middle side of the screen, which like this uh, base here, this organic base. So basically by using this HMTA, we are able to get zinc nanorods with a spect ratio around two, okay? So basically, the rods were like twice uh, wide than large, okay? And the other uh, uh, base we used was sodium hydroxide, basically, very simple. Uh, so, and obviously there's some adjustment like the, the molarity of then the number of moles in order to get ex uh, around those aspect ratio. So with using sodium hydroxide as the base, we're able to get aspect ratio around six, 0.5 nanometers, okay? So much longer nanorods uh, in comparison to the, uh, to the width of them. And then we use those nanorods, we compare them, the performance of them in the degradation process of the tetrazine using a experimental, uh, a more statistical approach called two to the four full factorial design, which I'm gonna comment a little bit more in the next few slides, how we did that, and which were the factors in that factorial design that we used in the levels of that design. But before we see in the design itself, let's see the materials, the features we got for each materials, okay? So uh, we did the X-ray diffraction, and from the X-ray diffraction, we found that the two nanorods, the two aspect ratios nanorods, they are very similar. They're pr uh, practically the same by uh, powder X-ray diffraction. They have both the vertzite structure, okay? Uh, we'll apply the Scherer equation to the, the peaks, the first three peaks we see in the screen, like the 100, the 002, and the 101. And it got us like a, a size around 17 nanometers for both samples. So basically by, um, uh, powder X-ray diffraction, there's no uh, substantial difference between the two nanorods. We couldn't see like any uh, noticeable preferred orientation that would decay like a higher aspect ratio, for instance, in the powder X-ray diffraction. So basically we have to uh, look for other techniques in order to get more information to see if it truly there was some difference between them as we expected when we start doing the synthesis. And we did a couple of them. So here, uh, as you can see in the top, uh, so basically the screen is divided in two panels. On the left side, like the red things, all information from there is about the low aspect ratio nanorods. So the ones that we are synthesized using HMTA. And on the right, we have the information about the high aspect ratio nanorods. Uh, on the left, uh, in the bottom part, we have like the BT isotherm graphs, okay? Uh, which indicates that for the low aspect ratio, we have a specific surface area around 22 square meters per gram, 
okay? And here on the right side, on the, the figure F, with symbol F, we have the, the same measurement for the high aspect ratio, which, which has like a, a surface area around 26 square meters per gram, okay? So basically, we didn't observe also a substantial difference in the, in the specific surface area from the materials as well, okay? But when you do the scanning electron microscopy, that's where we start observing the differences, okay? Looking at, at the left panel, the low aspect ratio, we see that uh, as we hypothesized in the two slides ago, they're, uh, they're much shorter, okay? They're a little like fatter, a little wider and much shorter than the ones we observe in the figure E, which is about the high uh, aspect ratio. And you did the part, the counting from the two dimensions, like the, the length and the width for uh, around like 250 to 300 nanorods on each, for each species of nanorod. And you found like, their short dimension, okay, which usually uh, the, oh, sorry, the shorter dimension for, for them is very similar, okay? So it's basically like 21 uh, nanometers for the low aspect ratio, as we see in the figure D, and around 31 nanometers, as you see in figure uh, age, okay? Then, uh, but like the longer dimension of the nanorods, they are very different. So for the low aspect ratio is around 42, uh, whereas for the high aspect ratio is around 200, okay? So those are the, the differences uh, that allows to determine like the aspect ratio from them. So basically the aspect ratio, we took like the value the average that you got from the longer dimension and divided by the average from the shorter dimension. That's how we reported those aspect ratios in the beginning, okay? So that's it. And you like as a convenience to not in the paper to not like mention the values all the time, we simply label them as low and high aspect ratio. And we did some stru uh, additional structural and uh, vibrational optical characterization on both nanorods. So we prepare like dispersions of then, I think was in ethanol as well. And you measure the uh, UVVs absorption spectroscopy, as we can see in the figure A. Uh, that's not much difference be between their spectra, okay? So they observe both around 270 nanometer. And then you determined, we estimate the, uh, we estimated the direct band gap of them by using the talk equation or talk plots. And we saw that very close as well. So like the low aspect ratio has a little higher band gap, but I, I don't even uh, know how reliable that difference is. Like it lies in the second decimal point, basically like 0.03 uh, electron volts. So basically very close band gap, around 2.2 for both of them. Then we measure the fluorescence expect spectrum of them, the emission spectrum with a 325 nanometers excitation. So pretty much like uh, two bands around 550 uh, uh, to 560, okay? And then we did the IR spectroscopy to track the presence of the possible ligands in the surface as we didn't have like any post annealing, uh, the only thing we did after synthesis is washing, okay? So usually wash with water, multiple, wash and centrifuge multiple times until you have like neutral pH in the supernatant. And what you can observe that there's uh, some peaks that are, some bands that are common in the low and high uh, spectration samples like uh, 3485, but like more importantly, so basically like as the presence of hydroxyl in the surface, but like we're able to observe uh, in the low aspect ratio, some uh, bands that are characteristic only from the HMTA, like in the 10, 13, 12, 33, and 14, 67 
reciprocal centimeter, okay? So yeah, so there is in both cases uh, some ligand in their surface, okay? And that's uh, much all that you can say about the surfaces about the IR, as we haven't done any XPS on those samples, unfortunately, okay? So uh, basically that's it. So yeah, if you, uh, there is some ligand left on them, okay? mostly in the AGMTA, what's the case. And then that's what start started the uh, full factorial design, okay? So what it is for those that may not be familiar with that. So basically is a statistical uh, approach to uh, apply to, to design, perform and analysis the results, okay? Uh, that's like a, a branch of chemometrics, okay? Uh, but uh, probably is like one of the easiest or more straightforward applications from chemometrics because people, before people start like PCA or other things like that. So basically uh, factorial design, it's a multivariate approach of design experiments. It's, uh, it like comes in opposition uh, of what you called one factor at a time, okay? Which usually the approach that you're taught to do uh, as chemist, like is very, so intuitively, let's give an example about what people would do they study if it was like a one factor at a time. So basically we had four factors in this experiment that are interested to study the, their influence in the results. So the aspect ratio of each nanorod, uh, what called the dosage, so basically like the how much, like the, the like the concentration or the density, so how much of the nanorod per uh, milliliter of solution, okay? We have the initial pH of the solution and you have the presence of the hydrogen peroxide. So you had these four factors to be studied, okay? If you're using like the approach that you're used to do like very one factor at a time, so suppose we would study like the uh, pH, okay? So basically we would fix a condition for the aspect ratio, a condition for the dosage, and a condition for the uh, hydrogen peroxide. And then we would vary the pH in a full range, maybe like even like from 10 to 14, for zero to 14, for instance, okay? And then that would be the time to study, and then we would find like a, a optimum point from there. That optimum pH would be like the basis to study the other variable, like the, for instance, the dosage. So would you fix the pH on that maximum value, the uh, aspect ratio and the hydrogen peroxide, the quantities we think that's the optimum, and you vary the dosage in the full range. And so, and then we do the same for the aspect ratio and for the hydrogen peroxide. So basically fix all the variables and you vary just one of them in a larger spectrum. So that's what you usually do uh, as experimentalists. And then that's what you have been taught to do uh, as undergrads as well. So in opposition to that, the full factorial design is based in the, this way, okay? So the name is very self-explanatory. When you say two to the fourth, the two has a meaning and the four has a meaning as well. The two means that two levels, okay? Which means that for each factor we're studying, instead of using a full range, we're just gonna choose two points, okay? So that could be two extremes in a point, okay? And the four uh, means the name of the factors. Like this case, we have four factors that are shown here. The aspect ratio, the dosage, the pH, and the presence of peroxide or not. And that's it. Uh, so basically the two means the levels and the four means the number of factors. Uh, usually the two to the fourth is like the more complex we can do like in a simple way without like having more specialized software for that. But it's possible they're like software like Minitab that is like designed to do like full factorial design uh, and then like much simpler to analyze. Another thing to observe here are those like codes A, B, C, and D, and like plus and minus that are that you're seeing here, plus one and minus one. 
So the codes A, B, C, and D, they're labels, okay? So as like each factor is labeled with a letter, okay? Uh, and then the plus and minus, they means like each, each factor, as I told, has two levels. So as a mathematical convenience, we call one of them, the lower level, the minus one, and the higher level, the plus one. And that has implications when you do the data treatment from the design, because there's a lot of matrix calcul calculation, which is all based in matrix that are made with this plus one and the minus one, okay? That like the full calculation, I'm gonna refrain on the presentation today. You can take a look in the paper and the support information from there. That's very detailed there, but like that's just to give you an idea about that. And the photocatalysis, like itself, we have like a schematic about how it's done here, okay? So basically in the first frame, we have, uh, we don't have any light being present in the experiment. That's done what's called in the dark, okay? So we take the solution containing the pollutant molecule and we add that to the, uh, and we add the zinc oxide to that and let it steer in the dark. The purpose of this first step is to let the uh, adsorption equilibrium to happen, okay? Because uh, those nanoparticles, those uh, materials, they can take the dye out of the solution, not only by photocatalysis, by the adsorption, okay? So the dye molecule can deposit on the surface of the material as well. And so we need to make sure in order to evaluate exclusively the photocatalysis, we need to make sure that all the possible adsorption has already happened, that all the decrease in the concentration you're observing is only due to the uh, photocatalysis itself. So the first step, the first frame in the figure is that we put the solution uh, with the powder and steer in the dark for a certain amount of time and track the concentration in such a way we see that in that until to the point we see the dye concentration becomes constant, okay? And then after that step, that's when you can turn on the light, okay? In this experiment, we use a LED uh, UV light with a emission maximum in 365 nanometers, so right below, right on that 2.7 electron volts, I would say. Uh, and then basically we track the, how the concentration, we take the samples out of the solution, we centrifuge to separate the remaining powder and track the dye concentration by the UVVs, okay? And as the things, as if the dye has been degraded as expected, uh, we are gonna see that coloration decreasing, which means that the dye concentration has decreased as well, okay? Uh, then you have like uh, results from the, uh, so first the two to the four factorial design. So like the, uh, what's nice about like the name, the things are named, is that it gives us also how many experiments, independent experiments we have to do in order to complete all the possible combinations of levels and variables. So to the fourth, we know results 16, okay? So it means that you have to do 16 different experiments in order to cover that full spectrum of four variables and two levels of variables. So it's possible to do 16 combinations for that. And you, uh, we evaluate two uh, response uh, variables on this study. One was the removal percentage that we saw in the left side. In the right-hand side, we saw the uh, rate constant, the first order rate constant. In the left side, we have the 16 graphs, like four on each um, panel, separated, okay? Uh, so re the removal percentage for them. In the right, we have like the 16 uh, linear feet for the pseudo first order kinetics, okay? That's how we got, uh, so we got the, as we know from the pseudo first order kinetics from the undergraduate courses, we take the rate constant from the slope of these graphs. So we took those results, we put it in a matrix get it, that you're gonna see in the next few slides, and we evaluated which were, which were the most efficient conditions, okay? 
And that's what uh, we are supposed to see in this uh, next slide over here. So you have uh, the matrix of the results. So the 60 experiments, as you can see here in the table heading, we have that coding that I presented a couple of slides ago. So A being the aspect ratio, B being, B being the dosage, C being the pH, and D being the presence of the hydrogen peroxide, okay? And you figured out that uh, the best conditions we're obtaining like we got like removal efficient around 92 and a rate constant around 3.8 times 10 to the minus two, uh, one over a minute. They will obtained like for high aspect ratio with a low dosage, uh, low pH and without hydrogen peroxide. Whereas the worst result, which was a removal around 8% was, get, it was got for the low aspect ratio uh, low uh, dosage, high uh, pH, initial pH, and the absence of the hydrogen peroxide, okay? So this would be uh, enough for a preliminary result, okay? Uh, so some people, they stop like the factorial design on this point, which like kind of like early, but like for some, some uh, application might be enough. So just they did experiment and then like they they picked, okay, this is the best condition and that's it. Uh, we went a little beyond on this study as you try to determine what's called effect of each variable, okay? That's what we're going to observe and comment in the next slide. So hold on. So this, uh, next slide is what's called, it's shown what's called effects estimation, okay? So besides that planning we showed in the previous slide that is done for the factorial design, well, another purpose of that is to evaluate which variables have a significant statistical effect on changing the result, okay? And that calculation uh, is done as I told by matrices calculation. So you can take a look in the paper as well. And basically we try to determine uh, not only the variables uh, independently, each one by itself, but also all the possible interactions possible. So we take all the possible combinations two by two, like the aspect ratio and dosage, aspect ratio and pH, aspect ratio and the and the presence of hydrogen peroxide. And you take then each variable three by three, okay? So, and like the four all together, four by four, okay? So it gives like a combination for 16 experiment, we have a total of 15 possible effects or combinations of effects. And we have a ways that you can determine with like 95% of confidence, which are the significance, which are not. So those graphs over here, you can observe a dashed uh, line, vertical line on each one of them. It's basically like the bars that are going beyond the dashed line are the ones that are have significant effect, okay? So for both cases, in general, we note that the aspect ratio, the pH and the presence of peroxide, they are significant, okay? So basically the dosage, um, it's not. So it means that you could have used like lower dosage or higher dosage, uh, it would not change substantially the results on that. And then, uh, then you have like combinations two by two. In the case of the removal efficiency, we have the combination between aspect ratio and the pH and aspect ratio and the hydrogen peroxide and the combination of pH and hydrogen peroxide. Whereas for the, uh, the rate constant, we have pretty much, yeah, pretty much the same combinations two by two, plus uh, a little combination between uh, aspect ratio and dosage. And then you have a three by three combination that was, um, that was valuable for both uh, cases. Uh, like for the removal efficiency, aspect ratio, dosage, and peroxide, 
and for the um, rate constant, aspect ratio, pH, and the hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so the take home message from calculating the effects is that uh, by knowing which effects or combination of effects are substantial, uh, it takes to the point that you can design a empirical model that would allow us to predict uh, how much those responsive variables would be in some untested condition, okay? So that's a third purpose of this factorial design. And that's what we try to uh, have done in the next slide, the slide 18, okay? So we took that uh, for each responsive variables, we took those effects or combinations of effects that are substantial and that are significantly meaningful, and we design uh, a math an empirical model from there, okay? And from that empirical model, we're able to do like surface responses from that, okay? So like here uh, on the left side, uh, the upper two graphs, the A and B, they are the response surfaces for the removal efficiencies. And then the C and D, the two bottom graphs, are the response surfaces for the rate constant, okay? So basically, those response surfaces, any point on that, theoretically, it would allow us to predict how much the removal efficiency or the rate constant would be. And then to test the validity of these, uh, these models, we tested some uh, conditions that were not previously tested as well. So on the right-hand side, on the top, we have the results. So I did four experiments, uh, four new experiments for conditions that were not initially tested in the design. So uh, in the, the upper table in the right is about the removal efficiency results and the bottom table is for the rate constant. We can see from then that. So the experiment 17, what we did different from there, so we kept the low aspect ratio, uh, the lower dosage with 400 milligrams per liter and the lower PA, initial PA, PA7, okay? And then we have, uh, we vary the amount of the hydrogen peroxide in a condition that was not tested initially. So, uh, so basically I think it was 15 micrograms per liter uh, on this case. This uh, gave us an experimental result around 20% removal efficiency and the model had predicted like a efficiency of 22%. So we're like very close from that. Experiment 18, so basically uh, we did pretty much, uh, we used the high aspect ratio, zinc nanorod, but like kept like the dosage 400 milligrams per liter and the pH at seven. And like the, 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 the hydrogen peroxide, 15 micrograms per liter. That would predict a removal efficiency of, uh, we got experimental removal efficiency of 37%. And the predicted by the model was like 74%. So we're off like by 50% on this case. The other case, we use low aspect ratio, low hydrogen, uh, low dosage. And then we use the P intermediate pH. So pH around 8.5 and you had hydrogen peroxide that we got a removal around 17% and the model uh, predict like 22%, okay? So like about 24% uh, error. And the last condition, the condition 20, we have the high aspect ratio, low dosage, intermediate pH 8.5 and uh, hydrogen peroxide around uh, 30 uh, microliters, sorry. Our result was 38% and the model predicted 34%. So like a 12% error. The same conditions like were used to evaluate the rate constant. And you see that we got like uh, uh, percent errors around like the lowest around like 16 and the highest around 67, okay? So basically, so basically for both conditions, we got like results around the same order of magnitude. There's not like anything that's like 
uh, very abnormal. We chose that model as like uh, with the simplicity of the experiments and the data analysis is a, uh, at least like a good enough model. Uh, obviously it works best, better in some conditions than the others, but in general, it's like a very, uh, like a reasonably good model. And then we expanded, uh, we expanded on that to try to see, uh, try to explain taking those uh, variables that are statistically significant and try to give some chemical context or for the reason why they are significant, okay? First, uh, about the aspect ratio, why the high aspect ratio nanorods were for sure much more effective than the low aspect ratio. And the explanation we found mostly based on the literature uh, to be able to confirm that explanation that would be necessary computational uh, studies to calculate like the, the surface energy from different facets in the crystals like model and a crystal nano rod and determine like the different facets that would be exposed and the surface energy on that. Uh, but like uh, the explanation, we're glad that zinc oxide is a very known material in literature. So there's a lot of things we can base ourselves from the literature. And we found that like for nano rods, very similar to the aspect ratio we had like around like six, that there's a high exposure of polar facets, the one that having Miller indices zero, zero, families in the Miller indices zero, 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 one, okay? which are polar facets have like uh, oxygen two minus exposed, okay? And having those polar facets, uh, it's a good way to have like more efficient photocatalysis, okay? Then you have like non-polar facets. So that would probably be one of the explanations why uh, high aspect ratio nanorods worked much better than the low aspect ratio ones, okay? Uh, then, the next uh, thing we tried to explain was about the presence of the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, in general, I think you would expect like initially uh, that the hydrogen peroxide would be a good, uh, would be a good uh, thing for the experiment because hydrogen peroxide, it, it's a holy scavenger, okay? Uh, uh, in that way that would like take the holes out and that would like uh, delay the combination between electrons and, and, and holes and make uh, the production of the reactive oxygen species more uh, efficient, okay? But that's not gonna happen, okay? Because uh, besides being a good radical producer, uh, the hydrogen peroxide uh, also, it has the effect that it's a, as you're gonna see in slide 20, it's a good, uh, it's also a good uh, OA to minus radical scavenger, okay? As you can observe here in those three chemical reactions. So it takes uh, the holes and forms the radical, uh, the water radical, but like it also can like lead the combination it can uptake out that all-wage radical in such a way that the two radicals can recombine and uh, produce like oxygen and water, okay? So basically we're decreasing uh, the efficiency of the holes and of like to produce the radicals and to, uh, to carry ahead the photocatalysis process, okay? And then about the pH, how, what possible explanations about like pH seven tends to take to a more efficient degradation than the initial pH 10, okay? Uh, usually it all relates, the best hypothesis we could trace is that it relates with the um, tartrazine deprotonation, okay? So the tartrazine molecule, as you can see here, usually neutral form, it has a, a charge minus three, okay? But when we have the pH seven, so basically there is a additional deprotonation, so it gets to tyrosine 
minus four, okay? So one more proton is taken. And that tetrazine minus four species, it's much more stable. You can see it has a resonance structure, okay? In such a way that uh, we, we are leading to the tetrazine to be a more stable species, which makes it harder to be degraded, okay? So those are possible explanations we have for those effects being effective or significant, statistical significant on the, uh, on the process, okay? So yeah, that's all uh, we have uh, as the presentation for tonight. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge the former members, uh, mostly those uh, students, they work with me at Ithaca College. So Jeffrey Taylor, which uh, about to defend his master thesis in University of San Francisco is looking, is applying for PhD programs. He was author two papers in our group. Okay, so really, really a nice student. Uh, Julian Kellner Roger, which was my very first student. He's now a graduate student in Cornell University. Anthony Di Bernardo, which was one of the students author of this work. He's now a graduate student, University of Wisconsin Medicine. Uh, Andrew Skinner was the first author in this student uh, right after he graduated at Utica College with his biochemistry degree. He went to the Pacific Northwestern lab to work as a staff member there. And Andrew Nicol, really nice student. He's still about to graduate this academic year. Uh, also the two current members of our group that has helping doing the things still even remotely uh, as we are basically unable to do any new experiments since March, basically doing all the pandemic going on. So Brandon Trope uh, has done like a lot of like uh, educational study. We did a lot of educational study as we're going remote, like designing new experiments involving uh, X-ray characterization technique. And we are glad that applied that in a, a past course this fall. So I just submitted a paper about this study to Journal of Chemical Education. And Dylan uh, show uh, Dylan worked with a synthesis of uh, titanium dioxides uh, in a project that are doing, uh, doing composite materials with uh, carbohydrates uh, and graphene oxide and uh, transition metal nanoparticles. And also my internal and external collaborator, Professor Mabubur Shalhuri from the Civil Environmental Engineering Manhattan College, as we have uh, a project related with like wastewater remediate, preparing filters from composite materials for wastewater remediation. Professor Nirupan Aich, like our uh, long time collaborator from University of Buffalo. Professor Rajesh Senesi from SUNY Plattsburgh. We published a paper together about cellulose nanoparticles used for wastewater remediation, but not for the catalysis, but adsorption in the same journal in uh, 2020, to uh, yeah, 2020, last year. So I hope to uh, resume that collaboration soon as we're able to return, hopefully be able to return this lab to the lab this year. And Dr. Jose Clabel from uh, University of Sao Paulo, the Institute of Physics, that you have a lot of collaborations about transition metal oxides and their op like growth process and uh, optical properties. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meekins for the opportunity. Thank you all for stay for like this uh, talk this time, like almost like midnight. And thank you so much. I appreciated that. I'm glad to talk any questions and comments. Thank you. All right, that was a fantastic talk. And we've got plenty of questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and get into them. Uh, let's see, so we have, Oh, the first one here is from uh, Rama. I'm about to sneeze, so hold on just one second. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so Rama wanted to know uh, if you have some idea, well, I guess you talked about the, the tartrazine and, and sort of what the composition is. Is, it, is that a good... Is that representative of a lot of different dyes? I mean, obviously, they're, each one is yes. going to have... You know, they're, they're all going to be slightly different, of course. They all have different properties. They have to be. But is, is it a good 
is it a good representative model for the dyes that you're that you're hoping to apply this to? Yes, because like it's a azo dye. So by being an azo dye, uh, it's a, like a usually they are recalcitrant. Okay, so because it's hard to degrade that like a nitrogen double nitrogen bond, it's not like that simple. So yeah, yeah. by being an azo dye it was like the main feature we're looking at, look at it at on that time. Okay, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, and like we have, as I told in that other paper that pro published Professor Senesi, we look at another azo dye, which is called aramine O, also yellow dye. Mm -hmm. uh, but like uh, uh, in that case, we applied mostly by the fact that the dye was cationic, so it has a clearly a positive charge when neutral. Uh, and as we are not doing photocatalysis, not aiming to break the nitrogen-nitrogen bond or any other part in the molecule. Mm -hmm. So use most of the purpose to analyze how that um, positive charge in the dye would interact electrostatically with a negatively charged cellulose nanoparticle. So yeah. that's how we did. Yeah, so that's that's the, the main feature. So you usually look like uh, electrostatic how recalcitrant the things could be uh, mm -hmm. and how representative it is. And depending on the study, you usually go like also for the more standard dyes that are usually like methylene blue, like a, a standard cationic yeah. dye mm -hmm. or rhodamine B or yeah. <laughs> rhodamine C for anionic dyes. Okay. Basically. All right. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm, this one is from uh, Kyle, and he wants to know what what does the basically what does the dye molecule break down to uh, when well, when you degrade it? What what are sort of the the end products? Because when you, you know, because you have the nitrogens yeah. in there, it's obviously not just going to be water and carbon dioxide. Yeah, uh, we don't with the amount of results we had in this study. There's no way to be sure about that. Okay, uh, it's possible to do that. Uh, so basically, the only thing we can we can know it is. The chromophore group in the molecule has been degraded, but mm -hmm. we don't know we, in which point and which are the end products. But it's possible to be done. We simply didn't do for this study because not the focus, but it's possible. So we just have, besides analyzing the things by the UVVs, mm -hmm. we just need to do like some chromatography coped with like mass spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, and HPLC MS, uh, LCMS, or things like that. Yeah. And then from there, you can clearly say which are the degradation products. So that's something we have on target couple uh, like uh, medium to long range in our group to be able to, mm -hmm. to do this type of things because it's something really important, something that the reviewers, they also, they, they ask about. Yeah. So yeah, it's something that can be done, but you haven't done specifically. For okay, all right, that, that's, that makes sense. I mean, that's like you said, it's not, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, but it is, it, it'll give you some more information certainly about the the way in which it breaks down. And so that might give you some more insight into some of the other conditional, you know, like, like the, the things you talked about where, you know, pH mattered, having peroxide present mattered, all that good stuff. Uh, okay. So this was one I had. Um, can you, could you use co-catalyst to, to try and enhance the rate of reaction? So it looked like you, you said you, ba you basically just had zinc oxide. If you put like, you know, cobalt, uh, the, the cobalt oxide phosphate is really popular, obviously, for like water oxidation. Um, could something like yes. that be, be targeted to try and enhance that reaction? Yes, I think so. Like a, a lot of strategies like doping, like in such a way you can take the uh, band gap down almost mm -hmm. as close as possible to the visible would be something desirable. So it make things more sustainable as we need like We'll be aiming to use like sunlight instead of like UV light. Mm -hmm. Another strategy making like um, uh, hetero structures, like cope with like maybe graphene oxide or using our cope like such a way that it could delay the recombination between electron and, mm -hmm. and holes and make them to produce more reacting with oxygen species. Another possible thing, like you told, combine with another oxide or phosphate in such a way that they can have some combination of properties that like would result in a band in a re different resulting band gap mm -hmm. and like uh, in such a way one can be separate the electron and holes in different parts of the composite. So for instance, the electrons become more concentrated in one of the component and the hole more concentrated mm -hmm. in the other. Other strategies, they delay the combination 
they delay the recombination between lateral and whole. Yeah. And as longer the lateral and whole be, become apart, stay apart from each other, more reactive oxygen species will be produced. Yeah, definitely. I, I think obviously need to see like if it's possible, how well they would like if it may truly would make a composite or heterostructural zinc oxide, mm -hmm. or if the things will stay completely apart, because it's part to have an interface. It's not like only the two materials as well. You have to have an interface between right. them. And that you can evaluate only by TEM, basically. Uh, yeah, so yes. <clears throat> yeah, those okay. things I, can be beneficial, I'd say. Okay. Um, this is one that just popped into my head. Did you do any... Any experiments like like you talked you showed that the kind of the possible reaction mechanisms just speaking generally, um, and you had you know either either an electron reducing oxygen making it a reactive oxygen species or uh, a hole uh, reacting with you know water or or a peroxide and forming an OH radical. Um, did you do any blanks where like you bubbled say you bubbled all the oxygen out and then did the reaction and, and looked at the degradation rate to try and get an idea of like which one of those was maybe the dominant reaction? No, I haven't. That's a great idea, but I haven't. The only okay. blanks we have then like do like the reaction, uh, do the process without the oxide to see if there's any degradation is only do the light, mm -hmm. which we verify that is not. So okay. the oxide needs to be present. Uh, do like the things in dark and light on and off things like that. But like this, this is a good idea. I haven't, we haven't thought about that, but it makes okay. sense. Yeah, to do like an oxygen-free environment to put yeah. like some nitrogen. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Another thing that's interesting is like use some like uh, intentionally use like whole or electric scavengers. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that exactly. That might be interesting as well. So that's something, but like you, I said, like that would be a completely new paper, basically. Oh yeah, it absolutely. Yeah. Would. But but that that mm -hmm. might be a nice combination yeah. with the uh, like like when you actually start looking at the products, right? So you, you exactly because that'll give you a full reaction mechanism. Yeah, that that, that was me. My, my next question was, or I guess next comment was that you could use a whole scavenger to to snatch the holes off the zinc oxide. And then see, you know, sort of this, the complementary work to, to bubbling the oxygen out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that would be a great okay. access to that. Cool. Uh, so Rama wanted to ask about, uh, or but she, had, she had a comment and said it would be interesting to see what cytochrome uh, P50s uh, will, would help degrade the dyes as well. And I don't, I don't know enough about cytochrome P50s. No, me neither, um, fortunately. But okay. you can talk, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're welcome to, to email me or we can talk about that later on. Okay. I mean, the Discord as well, so that's... Yeah, yeah that's definitely. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I will probably have to talk a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this was a question. So uh, both I and, and Fayer had this one. Um, on Back on slide 15, uh, in the bottom... Particularly in the in the bottom right, so the on the rate constant graphs in Figure D, mm. um, the the high aspect ratio, seven hundred milligram per liter pH seven with peroxide, seems to deviate, yeah, pretty significantly from the first order kinetics, um, or the, the pseudo first order. Do you have an idea for why that might be? No, I don't. That makes sense. Yeah, I don't. So if you observe like in the, because like the concentrations, they're basically mm -hmm. all measured based on the removal. So if you look at the graph, the left side D as well, yeah, we see that initially like it has a maximum around 30. Right. And then it starts to like decrease slightly to the like around 25. Mm -hmm. That's like the data treatment. So consequence from this change in concentration probably. But like the, uh, yeah, the idea, uh, no, I don't have like a clear explanation about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. I wonder, I mean, it may, it may be as simple as just a deactivation because it looks yeah. like something similar happens in C. Uh, and I don't recall what the difference between, oh, it's, it's the low aspect ratio. So even, so in C, the same, the 700 milligrams per liter pH seven with peroxide Mm -hmm. um it you know, yeah it, it, it yeah. removes a little bit more but i'd be curious mm -hmm. yeah rama makes a good point it could be a secondary complex formation but yeah. maybe, maybe yeah, and it's interesting that 
they both happen the same pH hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. combination. That's yeah. that's the indicator that could be something related to that. Yeah. So that, that, that that's okay. There you go. There's another paper right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, you you kind of touched on this, but I'll go ahead and ask it, and you can kind of maybe elaborate on it. Um, how much degradation did you observe in the blanks? Uh, I'm especially curious about when you, the ones that you did in the presence of peroxide, um, mm. especially wow. with with the UV light shining on it. Did did the peroxide bite like without without any any zinc oxide at all? Did did you see a lot of degradation there or no? I think that's low. It probably like not none of them like are more than like a ten per ten percent. I would say yeah. Okay, okay. So so yeah, the, the yeah, blanks the blanks were actually pretty blank. Yeah, pretty blank. They yeah they need a zinc oxide to okay. get that. Yeah, I have that in the support information in the paper. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Rama says maybe you found a a, a novel compound substituting some nitrogen for the oxygen. Or, I'm sorry. So yeah. substituting oxygen for nitrogen, you're making a new dye. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she, so she actually she had another another couple of questions here. Um, so could you use the factorial studies to try and start predicting? Um, so can can you predict the contamination levels under various weather, and then things start looking at things like divalent uh, ion interference and other conditions like that? So I guess. I so, can you, can you, could you take this factorial study and sort of blow it out to even more more conditions, basically? Yes, it can. Actually, it can be used for any experiment, not only for chemistry and not only for this type. So it's basically as like it can be applied for any experimental situation when you have a problem that you have many variables mm -hmm. that you can look into. Yeah, definitely it can. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done with that. The, obviously, the things, if you grow the number of variables and the number of levels, it grows in complexity, how the, the mathematical treatment you do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, definitely it can. You just have like to have a good problem question that you, that you would like to answer. And you have a, a, some idea about what would be the... Uh, the possible variables that would worth studying mm -hmm. and the possible extremes that would look into. The definitely can be expanded. Yes. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, I'm about to, so this, sometime this spring, there will be a book chapter that I wrote about this. Okay. When I do like uh, completely from scratch, the full factorial design for the, for a hypothetical situation for a fictional data mm -hmm. and then i comment like each step what you can do so hopefully it can be useful for people in the future like to to try to reproduce i'm still like i'm not a specialist i'm far from that i try to to keep that alive in my group at least one of the projects mm -hmm. and learn more and more over the years but definitely can it's like okay. it, it, it can take like a very complex situations as well and you mentioned what you said was was it Minitab is the program that'll yeah. that'll help like because Ram was asking about can you kind of automate it and it sounds like maybe yes, Minitab is is what would you you what you would want to use for that yeah yeah that's the probably people use the most but like I I usually don't automate because. I try to do like step by step because math is not complicated. It's basically like you're multiplying matrices mm -hmm. uh, and get the results from there. So like linear algebra, okay. uh, we can do like that multiplication even on Excel basically, but you can. So basically kind of commercial programs like Minitab, you just like input like the variables, the levels and the results. Mm -hmm. And they, they give it out all the graphs ready basically. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound very useful. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So it's so all like you know, I'll, I'll work like this, like for myself, and like during the class time, would it take like a month and a half to yeah. do all the calculation? Can do a couple of seconds. Basically. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Uh, all right. So and then the last question we have here is, uh, yeah. Okay. So ba so all of these reactions that that you talked about tonight were done in uh, in in air, basically correct. So like oxygen yes. was present at all times. Yes. Did you did you ever vary it or or did you just always do it under atmospheric? No, okay. re regular atmosphere. Okay. You don't purge or 
like our do like oxygen free condition okay i guess if, i mean if we're thinking of, of crazy things to try you could also try like bubbling oxygen through there just mm -hmm. you know increase the the level <laughs> see yeah. if you can supercharge it that would be kind of interesting too yeah okay for sure uh so i guess i'll say if, if there's any more questions go ahead and get them in uh, but uh, again, this was this was an interesting talk. Like I said, uh, I, I love photocatalysis, and it's been a long time since I've gotten to do any. So it's nice to uh, it's nice to see some good work still being done with it. And this is uh, yeah, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you, I thank you, Dr. Dickens, uh, taking the time to give it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like thank you, thank you all for for staying and watching and asking yeah. the questions. We appreciate all the questions and ideas, and I'm open to any to further any discussion. Want just email me, or take a, a comment on Discord or Twitter. I'm usually more present on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. So welcome to all to to follow me, follow each other, and you can even start in conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I wish you all happy new year. Very. Uh, much better 2021 than 2020 <laughs> yeah. for all. Yeah. And uh, healthy and safe for all. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, I guess with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks again to, to Alex for a great talk. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, we actually have a, a parasitologist uh, from, the, the, from Ghana, uh, from the University of Ghana. She's a research assistant there. Um, and so that one, that'll be a brand new one, I think, for everybody. But I think it'll be fantastic. Uh, and so we got that to look forward to. So we'll be back here next week. Uh, until then, uh, as Alex said, I hope you're, I hope the new year uh, starts to get a little bit better real soon. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe, wear a mask, and uh, we will see you next week. Thanks again. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>